Good evening, everyone. This is Ramiz Rahman. I want to thank you guys for joining me on this Friday evening. I want to put a special thank you to the Critical Care Service Line and the entire RFS in general for giving me this opportunity. I've seen some of the other uh, webinars that have been done in the past, and I really like the content. It's out there on YouTube for everyone to see. And I really am honored by this opportunity to be able to contribute and add to their database of content. So with that being said, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk today a little bit about the strange times that we've been living in uh, these last few months. We're in the midst of a global pandemic at this time, as we are here tonight speaking about it. We live in just a very strange time in general. Um, and this global pandemic definitely doesn't help. But one thing that's really fascinating as well as frustrating about preparing this talk and giving this talk tonight is the fact that information about COVID-19 in general um, is very dynamic and continues to evolve, continues to change. And there, as, you'll, as we'll go through this talk, you'll see that there's a lot of questions that are left unanswered. And there's a lot of stuff that we just don't have the answers for yet. But the important thing to understand is that that's OK. It's OK to not have all the answers to begin with. And just understanding the fact that we are here discussing the information that we know and information that we will hopefully get to know uh, in the future is kind of honoring all the individuals that have lost their lives during this pandemic and to this virus uh, as a whole. So, you know, with that being said, I would like to just begin and we can uh, go through it and go from there. So this screen is kind of an eerie part of daily life now. This is the Johns Hopkins uh, University of Medicine Coronavirus Resource Center. This is the global map. We've all become eerily used to it. We This kind of gives a real-time projection of the coronavirus cases throughout the world. The reason why I have two images here is because I was originally supposed to give this talk about two and a half, three weeks ago, and the image at the top was the screen that I had from that night, the night that I was supposed to originally give this, this webinar. And as you can see at that time, there were 17 million cases. The bottom figure is the, the global map from tonight. There's 22 million cases. Deaths in the United States at that time were 150, 151,000. Now we're close to 175,000. So although we're we are away from the peak and far past the peak, we're all starting to have reopenings and we're starting to go back and transition to somewhat of a normal life. I just wanted to highlight the fact that COVID-19 is still very, very real. It's still spreading. It's still highly contagious and it still continues to take people's lives. So, when we're going to start talking about COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus disease 2019, we have to talk about the potential epicenter of it all, Wuhan, China. Several cases of a pneumonitis of an unidentified origin were emerging coming out of China. This was back as early as November 2019 were the first reports to the World Health Organization. By the end of December was when this kind of an epidemic was really reported to the World Health Organization and slowly, very rapidly since then, this COVID-19 began to spread and be uh, became the pandemic that we know that it is today. Um, it turns out that this COVID-19 coronavirus disease 2019, a coronavirus was the pathogen responsible for this COVID-19. And I know in this particular setting, it goes without being said, However, we live again in crazy times. There is no such thing as COVID-18. There's no COVID-17. There's only a COVID-19 that stands for coronavirus disease 2019 because this SARS-CoV virus, this novel coronavirus is the pathogen responsible for coronavirus disease 2019. Nowadays with the media, you know, you never know. You hear some crazy things, but there is no COVID-18. There is no COVID-17. There's only a COVID-19, which is the name of the disease and the pathogen is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a novel coronavirus. So then it turns out that this novel coronavirus became the third lethal pathogenic human coronavirus. We had the bird flu 
H5N1 or SARS back in 2003. Then we had MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, back in 2012. And now we have SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19. All these coronaviruses kind of main target organ and how they're really considered is a respiratory virus. And again, the SARS-CoV-2 is another essentially respiratory virus, but as we'll continue with this talk, we'll start to see that it gets a little bit more complicated than that. So here's like a schematic of the basic timeline from when the reports first started coming to the World Health Organization to when it was finally declared a pandemic. As I mentioned before, it was the end of December when the Chinese formally uh, notified the World Health Organization about these cases of a mysterious pneumonitis. It wasn't until the 7th of January that it was determined that the pathogen is a novel coronavirus. Um, we had the first case outside of China by the 13th of January. We had the first case in the US by the 20th of January. Soon after that, we had the World Health Organization declaring a public health emergency. That was the end of January. Um, by February 9th, we had the death toll in China exceeding that of the original avian flu, the, co the SARS-CoV, the original um, novel coronavirus from 2003. And then it wasn't until March where the World Health Organization actually declared this a pandemic more than just an epidemic. So we have to discuss transmission and believe it or not, even transmission becomes a very complicated issue. Early on from the beginning of this um, epidemic and pandemic, we knew that uh, SARS-CoV-2 spread via the contact and the respiratory droplet route. That's the main reason why, you know, even till today, we still, it's highly recommended for frequent hand washing as well as, you know, wearing masks and social distancing. When we have viral particles being emitted from somebody, like as you can see in, the, in this drawing here, we have a whole spectrum of sizes of viral particles that get emitted just from speaking, coughing, uh, you know, yelling, uh, sneezing. We have particles that range in sizes from less than one micron to hundreds of microns. The heavier particles are the ones that, because of gravity, tend to fall down to the ground and they, they usually tend to fall closer to the individual that's uh, spreading them. Um, that's why we have a minimum of at least six feet. These usually don't travel further. Um, they, they can go up to 12 feet. However, there's usually a minimum of at least six. They usually don't go less than six feet and the heavier ones kind of tend to settle down. But what makes it a little bit more complicated is the fact that these, there's other particles, it's a spectrum of particles. When you, when you have release of, this, of these uh, virions, it's a spectrum. Some of them are larger in size and some of them are very, very small in size, down to less than a micron. These really, these smaller particles can sometimes become airborne and they become suspended within the air. It wasn't until very, very recently actually, and when I say recent, I mean by last month, that the World Health Organization finally recognized that SARS-CoV-2 has a potential for airborne transmission. Other airborne illnesses that we are aware of, things like measles, chicken pox, um, TB. TB, although, you know, you, as you know, it is a bacterium, it's not a virus, but these are all via airborne transmission. Airborne transmission gets treated differently. We use coverings to cover our mucosa because we know these viral particles infect our mucosa. We also use like N95 respirator, different than respiratory droplets. Respiratory droplets having something like a surgical mask is usually enough to prevent respir respiratory droplets from uh, being spread, at least prevents it. But in terms of airborne transmission, respiratory, uh, having a surgical mask doesn't prevent you from inhaling the, the, these viral particles. So when it comes time for airborne transmission, things like coverings for your eyes, as well as N95s, that's, that, that becomes a domain of protection when it comes to there. And you may have noticed, even in your individual institutions, in my individual institution where I'm training at now, um, we were all given goggles, and that happened recently, that, that happened last month, where whenever we have any patient contact, we were advised to always wear goggles besides just wearing a mask. And then the other question that comes is asymptomatic spread. That's still something that's kind of unknown. We still don't understand how, how much asymptomatic spread there is, and if there even is any asymptomatic spread, 
airborne transmission as well, kind of going back to that, I also said that the World Health Organization recently recognizes the potential for airborne transmission. Airborne transmission alone is very difficult to prove. And it also has major, major implications when it's when it comes time to um, social isolation and reopening of schools. So it has major implications. So because of that, the World Health Organization is very uh, particular about declaring airborne transmission. But at least now they recognize at least there's there's a potential for it. So although you see transmission should be something which we think is should be very simple, um, SARS-CoV-2 it's very it's very broad and likely it spreads via multitude of these different routes. It's not cookie cutter and falls into one particular type of spread. So this also contributes to the fact that you saw on the global maps how contagious this is and how, uh, how, how easily it spreads. It's because it's probably a multitude of this. And then also when you have these small particles, we still don't even know how much of a viral load is needed and, or how much of a viral load actually exists in these uh, airborne um, virions that are airborne. So again, you know, it depends on the environment and it depends on a multitude of factors. So because of that, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly how, how it spreads. So this is one of the things that leads to how dangerous this SARS-CoV-2 is and um, why precautions need to be taken seriously. So in, in order to really understand what exactly this pathogen does to our body, we need to begin with our immune system and kind of go over a brief review of our immune system. So we have the red marrow cells, which kind of serve as the foundation of producing our immune cells. We have, and these red marrow cells are found in our flat bones. Those include the, the femur, the pelvis, um, and the sternum are the major flat bones that have this red marrow. These uh, stem cells essentially produce our red blood cells, white blood cells, our platelets. We have two main lines of our immune system. We have the innate immune system that originates with our myeloid progenitor cell. Some of the major players in the innate immune system that you need to keep in mind um, for future of this talk is going to be things like the macrophages and the neutrophils. Then we also have the lymphoid progenitor cells. And from the lymphoid line, that um, creates our adaptive immune system. And from there, the major players are going to be the T cells and the B cells. Now, communication between these cells is via these special molecules called cytokines. Cyto in uh, Greek <clears throat> means cell, and kinos means movement. So what these cytokines do is what they facilitate communication and movement between all the different types of cells of our immune system. And what they essentially the goal is to, to uh, recognize as well as stimulate a response towards areas of infection, inflammation, trauma, and kind of send over a signal which allows for an immune response to be generated. More on cytokines soon. Here's another schematic that kind of shows again the multipotential hematopoietic stem cell coming from the red marrow. Main two lines, the myeloid progenitor cell, lymphoid progenitor cell, of the myeloid, like I said, macrophage is, is a big player to keep in mind, neutrophils as well. And then of the lymphoid progenitor cell, we have the T cells and we have the B cells, which are the major players that we need to uh, be aware of. So like I said, the goal of these cells and the goal of these cytokines is to uh, elicit an inflammatory response. And this is our first line of defense. Clinically, we were taught in pathology, rubor, color, dolor, and two more, redness, heat, pain, and swelling as clinical signs of inflammation. And essentially, this is, like I said, our first line of defense. So we have these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Big players to keep in mind are going to be IL-6, IL-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And there's also anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it's kind of a balance between the two that regulate and elicit an appropriate immune response when it comes to, uh, to facing a pathogen. And this balance, as you know, you can kind of tell, even though I'm oversimplifying things, you know, this is not a deep 
uh, immunological lecture, but I'm trying to oversimplify things, but it's a very delicate balance between these pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines in order to elicit an appropriate response. And as you know, if something goes wrong with this response, that's when we can have a lot of dangerous outcomes as we'll see. Now, what makes these cytokines also a lot more unique and a lot more complicated is that they have a multitude of functions that work together. Some cytokines have an autocrine function, which means that they act on the cells that actually secrete them. Some of them have an endocrine function, which means these cytokines will act on cells that are distant um, to lead to a more global response. Some of them have paracrine action, which means these cytokines deal with cells that are neighboring and nearby. And like I said before, there's pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So all this is what happens in our body in response to a pathogen. And all this working together leads to a immune response. And if something is goes wrong with it, you can have something that will lead to an overactive and overstimulated immune response. And that's what will lead to a lot of problems. And at this point in time, SARS-CoV-2 likely leads to an overactive and overstimulated immune response. And a lot of the uh, mortality that we see with COVID-19 can be attributed to that. So again, more about coordination and these pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, interleukin-6 is a big one to keep in mind. Then you have these anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-4, 11, 13, and 10. Interleukin-10 in particular is a very potent suppressor of interleukin-1, 6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So interleukin-10 is a big anti-inflammatory cytokine. Here's another schematic. And again, this is very overly simplified. But even then, it just kind of gives you a brief idea of how complicated and how uh, interconnected a cytokine response is for generating uh, an inflammatory response and, and in particular generating an appropriate inflammatory response. It just goes to show you how many interleukins and how many cytokines are involved. And then we have, besides just these cells, then you have chemotaxis and, uh, and the introduction of other cells such as fibroblasts and other, other cells that, that lay on other uh, hyaline membrane disease and uh, scarring. And we have a lot of other inflammatory factors that, that come into play, but these are just the immune cells here. So now we have to discuss the storm, the cytokine storm, which is kind of like the, the uh, title of this talk, weathering the storm. And when I'm, when I'm referring to the storm, I'm referring to the cytokine storm. It's also known as the macrophage activation syndrome, cytokine release syndrome, any names um, for the cytokine storm. It was first described in 1993 in the setting of transplants, in particular graft versus host disease, but it was mainly popular, popularized in the early 2000s um, during the first SARS-CoV infection. Um, so essentially what happens with the cytokine storm is you have this overactive and overstimulated immune response, which ends up leading to a multitude of problems that are the result of an overactive immune system. You have a lot of collateral damage that happens to a lot of organs because of an overactive immune response. Um, a positive feedback loop essentially becomes created and you have um, unregulated activation of our immune system, um, which ends up leading to a lot of uh, collateral damage. And that's basically one of the proposed mechanisms of why mortality in COVID-19 is so dramatic and is so high is because of this, because it's able to elicit a cytokine storm. But we'll talk more about how exactly does that happen. So how does a normal immune response happen before we understand exactly how we have an unregulated and overstimulated immune response? Normally the way it happens is we have um, an antigen gets taken and we have a, a pathogen from the outside um, we have an antigen presenting cell, usually a macrophage, which engulfs it, processes it, and ends up presenting this on an MHC class two receptor. If you remember this back from medical school, this receptor then interacts with a T cell receptor, and this via the action of cytokines triggers a T cell uh, 
response and starts to activate the T cells. Normally, an antigen stimulates about 0.1% of the T cells. Now, in order to understand how exactly the immune response gets dysregulated, we have to understand this concept of a super antigen. Now, I'm not saying that it's proven that SARS-CoV-2, the, the pathogen, leads to a super antigen response, but we do know that SARS-CoV-2 leads to cytokine storm. What we understand currently for cytokine storm is that cytokine storm usually gets initiated by something called a super antigen. So that's why I think it's worthwhile for us to discuss the concept of a super antigen. So a super antigen is basically after the macrophage in, engulfs and then presents this antigen on its receptor to bind to a T cell, we have on this lymphocyte, we have another uh, activation site that gets that that some binding occurs on an accessory site besides the one that is supposed to happen with the MHC class two receptor. And this binding of this accessory site by this super antigen leads to T cell activation and unregulated T cell activation. And as more macrophages present more cells, they bind to the MHC class two uh, uh, with the T cells and then they also bind to this adjacent site and leads to more activation, more release of cytokines, leading to more activation, leading to more binding, leading to even more activation. So essentially we have a positive feedback loop uh, which causes dysregulated um, T cell activation. So remember how a normal antigen normally stimulates about 0.01% of our T cells. A super antigen has the potential to stimulate up to 25 to 30 percent of our T cells. So as you can see, that's a massive increase of T cell activation. And like I said, when the more T cell activation you have, the more pro-inflammatory cytokines are released. And with this binding at the adjacent site, and you have a dysregulated immune response, all the negative effects of pro-inflammatory states uh, become uh, manifested. So like I said, it's not 100% known if SARS-CoV-2 exactly uh, acts in this mechanism. However, this is the, the accepted mechanism of a super antigen leading to a cytokine storm. And it's usually, uh, a cytokine storm is usually triggered by a super antigen. So it's likely that SARS-CoV-2 acts in a very similar fashion to this. But how exactly does SARS-CoV-2, the pathogen, enter our cells? And that's when we have to talk about these ACE receptors. ACE2 receptors are used as the gateway for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to internalize and enter our cells. These ACE2 receptors are found in many, many cells throughout our body. Some of the major ones are the heart, the back of our throat, our tongue, the lung, in particular, the type 2 pneumocyte, the type 2 pneumocyte, if you remember, is the one that secretes surfactant. So it, it's um, responsible for uh, surfactant production, which is going to, and, and also it is responsible for the elastic properties of, of the alveoli itself. Other cells are like the kidney, the brain. We even have some ACE2 receptors in our gut. And that's why sometimes you can explain why some people have GI-related symptoms. Um, blood vessels, our endothelium has ACE2 receptors. That's important because you can have endothelial damage, as you'll see, which can end up leading to um, prothrombotic states. And the, and the complications of that are liver. And then what's also unique about this ACE2 receptor is that this ACE2 receptor is also an immunomodulator. So what exactly does that mean? That means that the ACE2 receptor also has an effect on our immune response. So normally the ACE2 receptor, when it gets activated, it usually dampens our immune response. So ACE, ACE2 receptor is a very complicated receptor, and this is the receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses to gain access into our bodies. But remember that just binding to the ACE2 receptor is just the first part of the strategy of a virus. It has to bind 
internalize and then it tries to take over our own cellular machinery to replicate and uh, emit virions. So it's, it's a two, two part process of binding on the outside as well as replicating. So this is from the Journal of General Virology from back in September 2012. This binding of the ACE2 receptor isn't unique to SARS-CoV-2. Actually, this is showing us that there's another coronavirus that we're studying at this time, which uses ACE2 receptors. The original SARS-CoV also used ACE2 receptors to, to gain entry, similar to how SARS-CoV-2 does. But what is, what is unique here, though, is that the SARS-CoV infection uses ACE2 receptors, but then it also down-regulates ACE2 receptors. And at this time, at that time for this paper, it was speculated that this down-regulation of the ACE2 receptors is what may be involved with the severity of disease. Well, it turns out that the SARS-CoV-2 also uses ACE2 receptors and also down-regulates the ACE2 receptor. Now, I know it may sound a little counterintuitive intuitive that the SARS-CoV-2 virus downregulates the production of the exact receptor that it uses to enter the cells, but uh, I'll get into it to see, so you can kind of understand why it's a little bit nuanced and how downregulation of the ACE2 receptor is potentially dangerous. So basically, when you have less ACE2 receptor, you have less conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 1-9. And you have less conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1, 7. Higher levels of angiotensin 2 lead to activation of this angiotensin 1 receptor. And this angiotensin 1 receptor is actually a pro-inflammatory receptor. Also, excess levels of angiotensin 2, which again are happening because you have less conversion of this angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7, because you have downregulation of this ACE receptor also leads to, in general, vasoconstriction, and in particular, uh, vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries, which leads to pulmonary hypertension, and that, had, and that represents its own slew of problems. Now, I know this is a lot of words and probably doesn't make any sense in anything I just said, but this, this uh, image here, this will probably help out a lot more. This is actually a diagram that I took from uh, Dr. Mike Henson. He produces a lot of great content. He's a pulmonary critical care physician who trained in his fellowship not far from where I trained in my residency. And this is, a, this is one of his diagrams and uh, I really think it's really helpful. So I think I'll kind of go over this diagram and hopefully what I just talked about in the last slide will make a lot more sense. So going through this diagram here, we have angioten uh, angiotensinogen, which is made by the liver, getting converted by renin, which is an enzyme made by the kidney, to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2 via the angiotensin converting enzyme or the ACE enzyme. Angiotensin 1 via the ACE2 receptor that we talked about before gets converted to angiotensin 1-9 and angiotensin 2 via the same ACE2 receptor gets converted to angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-9 and 1-7 actually lead to a vasodilatory response, and, it's, and, and these are antifibrotic uh, molecules. So these are anti-inflammatory, essentially. Now, when you have SARS-CoV-2 binding to these ACE2 receptors and then down-regulating them, we have blockage of the pathways that lead to those angiotensin 1-9 and angiotensin 1-7. So when you have a buildup of angiotensin 1 and in return angiotensin 2, you have more of a tendency to go down the path of activating this angiotensin 1 receptor, AT1R, and this is actually very, very much pro-inflammatory. It leads to massive vasoconstriction, and in particular, like I said, pulmonary arterial constriction, which will lead to pulmonary hypertension which will end up leading to hypoxemia. Other than that, it leads to a slew of pro-inflammatory uh, state leading to pro-inflammatory cytokines being released, and it's pro-fibrotic, which ends up leading to a pro-thrombotic state. So it increases the chances for um, venous thromboembolism and just thr thrombosis in general. Now, 
one very common question when you're looking at this diagram, you see ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which are very much commonly used to treat hypertension. You see that in theory, based off this diagram, using an ACE inhibitor, using an ARB can actually block this pathway, which leads to the activation of the angiotensin 1 receptor. <clears throat> However, it gets more complicated than that. If you remember, during this entire epidemic, pandemic, the, those individuals that are most highly at risk are individuals with pre-existing conditions. Some of those pre-existing conditions include diabetes as well as cardiovascular disease, in particular hypertension. Most individuals on these with these pre-existing conditions are on these medicines, ARBs and ACE inhibitors. And as you can see clearly, it's not, not helping them. Essentially what's, what's happening is when someone is on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, you have upregulation of this ACE2 receptor. So you actually have more ACE2 receptors. So you have more of chances of SARS-CoV-2 from binding and end, gaining entry into the cells. Now that might lead someone to believe, okay, well, if that's the case, maybe we should take um, diabetics and um, hypertensives off ACE inhibitors and ARBs and maybe use a different type of med medicine. But remember what I said earlier, infectivity is a two-part process. One, is, one part of it is just binding the outside cell receptor and gaining entry. The second part is actually taking over the cellular machinery. There's been some articles out there that kind of propose the fact that people who have hypertension diabetes and other conditions that require them to take ACE inhibitors and ARBs, because they have upregulation of ACE2 receptors, you have a chance of multiple SARS-CoV-2 pathogens binding multiple ACE2 receptors. And when that happens, you have viral RNA being injected through multiple sites. And sometimes when you have competing viral RNA, that can actually mess with the process of taking over the cellular machinery and actually prevents the virus from actually replicating and releasing its virions. So it's a lot more complicated than that. There really is no true answer. At this point though, it is recommended that if you are on ACE inhibitors or ARBs to stay on them. There's a lot more harm with us taking, taking them off and there still needs to be much more research into what happens with the ACE2 receptor on patients who take this. But essentially, long story short, is this downregulation of the ACE2 receptors leads an individual to go into a very pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic, and uh, vasoconstrictory response. And all three of these ends up leading to a lot of the sequela we see with COVID-19. So what's the bottom line? The virus binds the ACE2 receptors to gain entry into the cell, leads to the mechanism that we just described, leading to massive amounts of infl uh, inflammation. We have vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries leading to pulmonary hypertension, which ends up leading to hypoxemia. And then we have formation of clots, which I know I didn't get into too much detail. I will get into more detail later, but we have formation of clots due to the effects of the H2 receptor on the endothelium, as well as the pro-inflammatory state leading to a pro-thrombotic state overall. So as you can see already, just from looking at the receptors and the way this SARS-CoV-2 works, it's, it's very complicated and there's a multitude of reasons which end up leading to such the levels of mortality that we see um, with this SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this is from the Journal of Cellular and Molecular Immunology. This is, was published back in March uh, 2020. So as if things aren't bad enough with everything I just described, the SARS-CoV-2 virus also shows that it has infectivity on the T lymphocytes themselves. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus can also infect a T lymphocyte. And this is despite the fact that a T lymphocyte actually doesn't have an ACE2 receptor uh, on its cell membrane. So I know that sounds weird after everything we just discussed, but this paper shows that the SARS-CoV-2 actually ends up infecting T lymphocytes and not only infected them, but it also ends up killing the T lymphocytes. What's surprising though, is that this is not entirely unique to SARS-CoV-2. It turns out that back in 2012 with MERS, the other uh, coronavirus, the lethal human coronavirus, 
from 2012, a very similar mechanism was seen back then where you had the MERS coronavirus infecting T cells and leading to them being lysed and overall leading to a lymphocytopenia. So unlike when you have the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen infecting other cells, it takes over the cellular machinery and actually divides. When it infects a T cell, the, the replication process stops, but it also takes out your T cell in the process. This is like a schematic from the same paper. And what this shows on the fluorescent microscopy, it's comparing the original SARS-CoV, the avian flu, to the novel coronavirus for COVID-19. And as you can see, we see these blobs with the novel coronavirus, and we don't happen to see the blobs with the original SARS-CoV. And what this shows is that the SARS-CoV-2 actually fuses with the T lymphocytes and actually infects the T lymphocytes. Now, another virus that infects our T cells is the HIV virus. However, the HIV virus actually replicates inside our T cells. The SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't replicate inside our T cells. Instead, it ends up taking our T cells out. So if it wasn't bad enough to activate a whole bunch of T cells and cause a massive inflammatory response, but then it also starts to destroy some of our T cells as well. And what's also unique is the fact that, I'm, as I mentioned before, there doesn't seem to be many ACE2 receptors or ACE2 receptors at all on T lymphocytes. And that goes, and that also may explain why this disease is so contagious because we actually don't really fully understand exactly how it enters our cells. So, and the fact that it infects our T cells shows that it may not just be as simple as just ACE2 receptors and the cells that have ACE2 receptors. There might be some other mechanisms of how the SARS-CoV-2 virus actually ends up gaining entry to our cells and the types of cells that it can potentially infect. So let's talk about the clinical presentation, which is sometimes is one of the hardest things about COVID-19, is actually recognizing it. Many different signs and symptoms, fevers, splenomegaly, cough, body aches, loss of taste, loss of, loss of smell, myalgias, coagulopathy, pancytopenia, eventually multi-organ failure. The whole purpose of me putting all these out there is just to let you know that this is extremely nonspecific. And because of that, it's very, very difficult to actually diagnose COVID-19 on a, on a clinical presentation alone. And that's why when the winter time comes, even if we don't end up having the quote unquote second wave, just the fact that we have mixture of other um, coronaviruses, as well as influenza coming back, we won't be able to tell the difference. It's going to be extremely challenging to tell the difference between COVID-19 and regular influenza pneumonia and COVID-19 pneumonia. So even if we don't end up having that uh, quote-unquote second wave, it'll still feel that way because, it, again, it's so difficult to pick up COVID-19 clinically. And many times when we have clinical conundrums, radiology ends up playing an important role. It could be a good thing for some, bad thing for others, but it is what it is. Radiology sometimes comes in to try to help with that. So what role does radiology play when it comes to COVID-19? If you remember early on when this pandemic began, there was a lot of literature coming from China that said that CT is more sensitive in the detection of COVID-19. And then after that, ER started blowing up with ordering CTs. There were so many uh, non-contrast CTs of the chest being ordered uh, because, of, because of this. Well, it turns out that this early report from China that compared CTs to um, the reverse transcriptase test, it actually compared with the oral swab, not the nasopharyngeal swab. So it actually compared it to the least reliable and least sensitive method of detection. And because of that, CT seemed like it was more sensitive. However, it turns out now that um, you should never be using CT to diagnose COVID-19. You can use it as a supplement. However, you, know, you really need to do um, reverse transcriptase testing to really be able to diagnose COVID-19. But despite that, we do have some certain patterns that can be more suggestive of COVID-19. So there is some role that radiology still can play. 
this is a very famous paper from early on of this pandemic from the AJR. It was from, it was looking at 919 patients with various imaging findings. And what we found was, you know, the buzzword for 2020, which was ground glass opacification. If you were in radiology, ground glass became the biggest thing. So this paper showed that 88% of individuals with COVID-19 had ground glass opacities, 87.5% had bilateral involvement, and 76% demonstrated peripheral involvement of their lungs. Here's an example from that paper. Here's a 79-year-old female, three-day history of cough and fever. This is day one imaging from being admitted to the hospital. You can see on the x-ray, bilateral opacities. You can see on the CT, we have these patchy multifocal ground glass opacities. Same patient, day four imaging. We see that the x-ray looks way worse. We have more of a diffuse consolidative uh, involvement. And then if you look at the CT, again, we, we're starting to see a little bit more denser consolidations. This particular patient uh, eventually developed uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, within the next subsequent days and uh, actually expired 11 days after admission. So you can see that the, the image on the left of the x-ray looks a lot like what an ARDS picture looks like. And even the CAT scan looks similar to what an ARDS picture would look like. And when speaking about ARDS, well, it turns out that besides that patient there, this is a report from The Lancet from back in February, and this is one of the early autopsy findings of COVID-19. Turns out a lot of the COVID-19 patients end up developing ARDS. So with this, this was an autopsy report of a 50-year-old male from China who was recently visiting Wuhan, um, on day 14 of his illness, he developed cardiac arrest, secondary hypoxemic failure. Some of his autopsy findings, liver microvascular steatosis, myolobular and portal activity. You know, liver injury could have been due to um, medicines that he was given to treat for the symptoms, but essentially his pathology came back ARDS. So let's talk more about ARDS. One of the main mechanisms of ARDS is actually cytokine storm itself. And ARDS, unlike a more focal process like a pneumonia, ARDS leads to uncontrolled uh, local as well as systemic inflammatory response is what ARDS kind of is. Um, and again, it has to do with the overabundance of cytokines and leading to an over overactive and overstimulated uh, immune response. We initially start off with acute lung injury and then eventually progresses to ARDS. We have diffuse damage of the alveoli as well as the capillaries. We have immense decrease in gas exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries, um, which ends up leading to a whole slew of issues and multi-organ failure. So it was actually the Lancet back in 1967, which first described this finding of ARDS. It was a case series of 12 patients. This was during the Vietnam War. These were wounded soldiers that had pulmonary edema on their x-ray. This pulmonary edema was very suggestive of CHF. However, remember, these are soldiers from the Vietnam War. So these are individuals in their 20s, young, healthy, essentially healthy combat soldiers who had the CHF-like picture on this x-ray. And that's what led uh, physicians to understand, to question why, why is this there? Around the 1970s, as CT scanning began to emerge and become more mainstream, they start to notice on these type of patients that the findings of consolidation wasn't a very homogeneous process the way, it, the way they thought it was from looking at the x-ray. It turns out it was a very heterogeneous involvement of the lung that was this ARDS pattern. And the mortality from ARDS, even now, ranges sometimes between 35 to up to 50% mortality. So ARDS still is a very hard condition to treat and COVID-19 related ARDS becomes even more of a difficult, as 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 you know, if you've, if you've been following the news and, and we see everything that, that we've seen with this pandemic, COVID-19 induced ARDS is actually even more difficult to treat. 
So this is more just talking about ARDS. Some of this stuff I already talked about. The fact that a pneumonia leads to a local uh, focal inflammation. ARDS is more generalized inflammation and leads to a more widespread damage of our lungs. You can just think of our lungs as giant uh, sponges um, that can sometimes, you know, as inflammatory damage happens, fluid begins to leak within them. These sponges become heavy. These sponges become more rigid, and that leads to difficulty of gas exchange, leads to hypoxemia, and eventually ends up leading to organ failure. This is actually images from that paper, which showed an autopsy of COVID-19 pneumonia. On the left, we have a slide of the alveoli, and this is normal. And on the right, we have COVID-19 pneumonia leading to ARDS. We see this thick island membrane. We see all these neutrophils and cellular debris within these alveoli. And all this ends up leading to impaired gas exchange and ends up leading to hypoxemia and multi-organ failure. So more on ARDS. We have decreased uh, elasticity of, of the lungs, decreased lung compliance. The, the lungs become more rigid, become more stiff. We have increase in the ventilation to perfusion mismatch, increase in, in uh, shunt physiology, dead space ventilation. All of this essentially leads to hypoxemia. Hypoxemia ends up leading to multi-organ failure. Now, just critical illness alone increases the chance of thrombi and a prothrombotic state. Well, it turns out ARDS actually ends up leading to an increased prothrombotic state even more than just critical illness alone. So besides, besides that, then you have the inflammation also leads to damage to the capillaries themselves. And the endothelial damage also ends up leading to microthrombi. So besides these larger thrombus of what we normally picture when it comes to thrombus, we have the formation of microthrombi within the capillaries. And that also contributes to the lack of gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood. And then remember, with endothelial damage, we have uh, the ACE2 receptor is also there on the endothelium. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus can also um, bind with that ACE2 receptor and lead to damage of the endothelium, which also increases the prothrombotic state. What are some of the major causes of ARDS? Aspiration. Uh, any type of pneumonitis, severe sepsis, inhalation injuries, severe trauma, pancreatitis, any type of real uh, insult to the body, which ends up leading to a dramatic inflammatory response, can end up leading to ARDS. And now COVID-19, because of its induction of a cytokine storm, is well known to lead to an ARDS. How do we diagnose ARDS? Well, there's certain criteria that need to be met when diagnosing ARDS. Number one, it needs to be an acute onset. It can't be a chronic problem. Number two, you need to have bilateral patchy opacities, which are suggestive of bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. That you can essentially look at, you know, just you don't even have to go to a CT. An X-ray is sufficient enough to be able to see patchy opacities and bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. Number three, it has to be non-cardiogenic in nature. What does that mean? That means that... Uh, it can't be due to left ventricular function uh, failure or or anything that has to do with, with the heart. The heart has to be pretty much normal. How, how do you check that? Back in the day, Swan Gans catheter would have, would have been uh, preferred. Now we can just do echo. We just want to confirm that it's non-cardiogenic in nature, these bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. Another name for ARDS many times is non-cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema. And that kind of encompasses number two and number three here when it comes to the definition. And then number four is you have to have a low PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So the PaO2 is the arterial oxygen, oxygen concentration, and the FiO2 is the uh, concentration of oxygen in the inspired air. So PaO2 we usually get from an ABG. If you remember when you you have your time in the ICU, ABGs where you'll get the PaO2 and then the FiO2 you'll get from you know if they're on any supplemental oxygen, if they're breathing room air, room air has 21% oxygen in it, and then if they're on a ventilator, you just look at what what the FiO2 is set on the ventilator. <clears throat> 
So a low ratio, low PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, basically means that the lungs are having a hard time with gas exchange. So the lungs are having a hard time moving oxygen from the inhaled air over to the blood. So gas exchange is being impaired. A ratio, a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 300 is diagnostic for ARDS. A, rate, a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 100 is category for severe ARDS. <clears throat> so we've learned a lot about management of ARDS over the last two decades, which have kind of helped a lot with the decreasing the mortality of decreasing the mortality that's associated with ARDS. So I thought it'd be appropriate for us to quickly go through some of these landmark trials that have happened and come, which have taught us a lot about the management of ARDS. This is the first major trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in the year 2000. And this looked at treating ARDS patients with mechanical ventilation, but in particular with low tidal volume mechanical ventilation. So what this looked at is providing tidal volumes to patients instead of being somewhere in the range of 12 ml per kg of ideal body weight. And remember, ideal body weight takes into consideration height because we're looking at lungs. Instead of giving someone you know, 8 to 12, which is more of a normal uh, tidal volume for someone who doesn't have ARDS, it looked, for, it looked to provide tidal volumes significantly lower, about half of that, 6 ml per kg of ideal body weight. And the premise behind this was the fact that as the alveoli would completely collapse and then these high tidal volumes would force the alveoli to open up again, the sheer stress of the collapsing and opening of these alveoli was increasing and compounding the, alre the already baseline pro-inflammatory state, which led to someone to, be to go into ARDS to begin with. So it was kind of perpetuating this inflammation. So what this study looked at was to use PEEP, high PEEP, um, to keep positive pressure in the alveoli to keep them from fully collapsing, and then using low tidal volumes instead of the traditional higher tidal volumes. And what they found is using high PEEP and low tidal volumes, mortality actually was able to be decreased from 40% to about 31%. So a significant decrease in mortality from using low PEEP, uh, from using high PEEP and low tidal volumes. Now, the thing is, when you use low tidal volumes, you're going to end up leading to hypercapnia. So as a response to this hypercapnic state, as the PCO2 is going to rise in our bodies because we have low tidal volumes, we are going to, the respiratory rate is going to increase. So what ended up happening is that in order to really in order to really facilitate this high PEEP, low tidal volume, we needed excess sedation to be able to sedate the patient deeply and then fully take over and synchronize the patient to the ventilator. Then the excess sedation has its own complications associated with it. You have increased risk of clots. Uh, you, can, you can become hypotensive and go into shock from excess sedation. But despite all that, the mortality still de decreased. And this is the standard of care now. When someone is in ARDS and you diagnose ARDS, high PEEP and low tidal volume is the way to go. In my internal medicine training, treated a lot of ARDS. A lot of them uh, you know, improved, some of them did not, but this was a standard of care. This is more on high PEEP and low tidal volume. Again, reiterating some of the things that I already talked about. PEEP is positive pressure, which keeps the alveoli open, preventing them from fully collapsing. Um, also, what they found was that increasing the PEEP also increased the homogeneity of the lung parenchyma. Remember, ARDS is a heterogeneous process. So this ended up improving the overall lung compliance. So this also helped with oxygenation. Now, like I said, Having 
if the patient, if the respiratory rate is high and you have someone on high PEEP and low tidal volume, it really doesn't make a difference. It's, it's, that's still not the best for the patient. So you really have to synchronize the patient to the vent. You have to really be in control of the patient's respiratory state. And the only way you can do that is by, by sedating them deeply. Or what you can do is with neuromuscular blockade. So this trial here with the New England Journal of Medicine from 2010 looked at paralyzing the patients to increase vent synchronous, uh, synchrony. And then they saw that mortality further decreased from 41% down to about 32%. So this also uh, decreased mortality even further, now paralyzing the patient to increase vent synchrony. Then this trial from 2013, prone positioning. I've only seen this done once. It's a very complicated process, but what this basically does is you prone the patient for 17 to 18 hours a day. You need a special bed to be able to do that. You need specially trained nursing staff to be able to do that. It's very difficult to maintain practically, but doing proning the patient for 17 to 18 hours a day further decreased mortality from 33% to 16%. So these were some of the big uh, landmark trial that taught us a lot about management of ARDS. Now switching over from just ARDS management, I told you we were going to talk about thromboembolism and prothrombotic state. We talked about multiple reasons already, but this is a paper that was from April from Wuhan, from China. Uh, about 25% of hospitalized COVID patients, in according to this, this trial, were developing some sort of blood clots. Autopsies also uh, showed that many of them uh, developed blood clots. They saw them in the lungs. They saw them multitude of places. They include venous and arterial um, clots. This is a study from the Netherlands from April, and this showed that even patients, even patients that are on prophylactic doses of anticoagulation, still up to a third of them still develop some sort of blood clots of the uh, among the ICU COVID-19 patients. This is from the Journal of Vascular Surgery, uh, also in April. It references the Netherlands paper and the Chinese paper. And this also talks about the fact that catheter thrombosis, DVT, and PE are all increased in uh, COVID-19 patients. So it suggests that many patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection are in a hypercoagulable state and end up developing some sort of clots. Then it also references this case series that happened here in America where one institution was had a case of COVID-19 pneumonia refractory to traditional treatments of ARDS. They ended up using TPA um, and that actually helped them treat the ARDS. So this, this paper also talks about that, which is also interesting using TPA and ARDS. This is one of the autopsy reports that I was talking about. Initially, early on, autopsy reports were harder to find because there wasn't guidelines on how exactly to perform an autopsy safely. As more and more autopsy reports started coming, you see these the sample here of these lungs. They're boggy. They're edematous. They also have pulmonary emboli within them. And the microscopy was also consistent with hyaline membrane disease, uh, proteinaceous debris, all consistent with ARDS. This is some blood work that I decided to put in there from one of the autopsy report. Uh, interesting findings here. This patient was uh, lymphopenic. We talked about how the SARS-CoV infection actually uh, binds and infects T cells. This patient also had transaminitis. Again, does SARS-CoV-2 affect the liver in a way that we're not too sure about, or is this just you know hepatic injury secondary to medicines that could have happened? Um, in this case, LDH was also a little bit elevated, but this is just some of the sample blood work from, from this autopsy report. Then this study from the New England Journal of Medicine shows that some patients actually developed an antiphospholipid type syndrome, leading to a, a hypercoagulable state while they had the COVID-19 infection. This, this talks about three particular patients. Uh, some pertinent blood, uh, lab work that they had were low platelets, elevated PTT, elevated fibrinogen, elevated D-dimer, and it turns out that they actually had a antiphospholipid-like syndrome, which again leads to a pro-thrombotic state. 
Um, this idea of having, of going into a transient antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is not unique to COVID-19. There are other critical illnesses which end up leading to a transient uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which leads to clots. But in this particular case, it, it just gave another another potential reason of why COVID-19 patients become prothrombotic. Um, the reason why I mentioned like these low platelets, elevated fibrinogen, because essentially at this point, you know, I've talked so much about all the different manifestations and all the different findings of COVID-19. The reason why I put these little findings throughout these slides is because really our goal should be how can we try to predict this for the future? Can we use something like if someone comes in thrombocytopenic and they have low platelets, can that be used as a predictor for increased mortality? You know, if someone has an elevated fibrinogen, could that be used as a predictor? If, if anybody has a ferritin level, could that be used as a predictor? So it's just, these are just kind of thrown out there to kind of see if we can find a way to predict who has higher chances for increased mortality in COVID-19. At this time, you know, unfortunately, we don't really have a mechanism to predict. So what's the bottom line? Bottom line is that COVID-19 pneumonia, SARS-CoV-2 infection, leads to a hypercoagulable state through a multitude of reasons. And because of that, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis recommends that all patients with the SARS-CoV-2 infection be should be receiving prophylactic low molecular weight heparin unless they're contraindicated. So at this point in time, it's better just to anticoagulate and if you've been involved, you know, during this pandemic, uh, I'm sure a lot of you had to leave your specialties. I myself, uh, although I'm not actively practicing internal medicine anymore, I also left radiology for a brief amount of time, went back to the ICU to assist, you know, our colleagues with, with patients. Um, so I was in the COVID ICU at, during peak time of the pandemic, and everybody was on, on uh, anticoagulation. And here, and this is one of the reasons why. Now, we talked about ARDS, we talked about the prothrombotic state, we talked about cytokine storm, but it gets even more complicated than that. What if the ARDS that we know, ARDS from those studies that we saw dating back up to two decades ago, what if that ARDS is different than COVID ARDS? This is a very interesting paper from Italy um, back in April, describes two different phenotypes of ARDS. It, it talks about an H-type and an L-type, a high elastase or a very stiff lung and a low elastase, less stiff lung type of ARDS. Remember how I said when we were diagnosing ARDS, we look at the PAO2 to FIO2 ratio. Less than 300 is diagnostic for ARDS. Less than 100 actually is severe ARDS. And if you look at these two images here, figure A and figure B, both of these fall into the category of severe ARDS, but the CAT scans look dramatically different. B has a lot more consolidation and you see ground glass, you see air bronchograms and you see these dense consolidations. Figure A shows some patchy opat airspace opacities, but doesn't look as bad as B but both of these are considered severe ARDS. And this is what was investigated um, with this paper. And basically what this showed is that, you know, just ARDS alone is, wasn't enough to explain the level of hypoxemia that these patients were developing and the mortality. That means that the inflammation alone that we saw in the lung parenchyma was not enough. So it started looking at other factors that could lead to this hypoxemic state. It looked at pulmonary vasoconstriction. It proposed pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to pulmonary hypertension and leading to hypoxemia. And it also talked about um, prothrombotic state that we just talked about in the arteries, capillaries, leading to impaired um, gas exchange. The microthrombi within the, within the capillaries leading to impaired gas exchange. So it was it so it shows that you know although we have this understanding of ARDS maybe covid ARDS is just different. So that's why it's not just about the cytokine storm alone it's a combination of the cytokine storm 
with pulmonary vasoconstriction with thrombosis, which ends up leading to the degree of hypoxemia that we see and the mortality that we see with COVID-19. So again, hypoxemia in COVID-19 COVID ARDS, one, it's from the inflammation due to ARDS, it's from the microthrombi that are formed in the capillaries, and then it's from the vasoconstriction from the, the high levels of angiotensin two, which end up, and all three of these end up leading to hypoxemia. So like, when it comes to this hypoxemia, what can we do? Because of this, the treatment for COVID ARDS is also very, very uh, complex and multifactorial. Sometimes we look at, you know, ventilator alone is not enough. It's just a supportive measure. There's been talks of using things like ECMO, even though it's very invasive, but I know some of my colleagues in Texas are very, uh, they're very much into looking at, you know, what ECMO can, can do for their patients. So it's, it's actually a very unique entity. We're in a very unique time in, in, in our careers. And it's a very unique opportunity for us to really um, lay the foundation for the oncoming generations who are gonna be learning off of the decisions that we make now in, in best way of treating patients now, as well as the patients of the future. This is a paper um, from Italy talking about low platelets, maybe increased uh, risk of severe disease. And again, like I said, you know, it's it's great to understand why things are happening or how things are happening, but you know, we have to really look out for how, how can we prevent them from happening. Maybe low platelet thrombocytopenia could be a risk factor for letting us know that there's going to be an increased risk of mortality with COVID-19 pneumonia. This is an article from JAMA, um, showed that patients, you know, 70% of them had lymphopenia. We talked about lymphopenia before. 58% had an elevated PTT, 40% had an elevated LDH. It also suggested that ferritin be used as a marker. Ferritin is a blood protein, contains iron, very cheap test to run. Um, it's an acute phase reactant. When I was in the ICU at my institution, they were using ferritin uh, to kind of monitor uh, response and they were trending ferritin. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, trying to figure out what, what, what could be used as, as markers of, of, you know, disease progression as well as treatment progression. So what do we do, you know, with all this information now, like what can we do with the cytokine storm? It's all about trying to restore the balance. And there's a multitude of um, therapies, proposed therapies, antivirals, steroids. You know, do we target specific cytokines? Do we try to neutralize interleukin-6, IL-6, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha? We have things that these monoclonal antibodies, tocilizumab, which targets IL-6. We have JAK inhibitors. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of the major ones. This was a journal of autoimmunity from back in February, um, showed that COVID-19 patients had elevated inflammatory cytokines. This is based off looking off, uh, off of autopsy findings, severe lymphopenia. All these findings suggested a dysregulated immune, immune response, AKA a cytokine uh, storm. And it spoke in particular about uh, the cytokine interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 levels were elevated in most of these patients. And then it talks about all the effects that interleukin-6 has, just like we talked about in great detail with cytokine, when we talked about cytokine storm. <clears throat> this is a, a, a systematic review meta-analysis from uh, Toronto which showed that, in, again, IL-6 levels were significantly elevated and associated with adverse clinical outcomes using tocilizumab, a monoclonal antibody to inhibit IL-6. Um, preliminary investigation is still being performed about that to try to target it. Um, again, it's kind of still a little bit too early. Like I said, when I first prefaced this talk, information keeps getting updated, information keeps changing. 
So at this time, as far as I know, like, you know, there's the role of tokelizumab, it's still, it's still kind of in the air how efficacious it can be. Talking more about tokelizumab and kind of preventing cytokine storm. And interestingly, tokelizumab and sarolimab, these are FDA approved already for cytokine storm. And right now they're, they're undergoing phase three clinical trials for COVID-19 induced uh, cytokine storm or COVID-19 pneumonia. So this is a you know, pretty famous, pretty viral video that was up on social media, then got taken down, these doctors outside of the Supreme Court. This particular doctor was talking a lot about hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine was all over the media. Um, she talked in particular about a cure for COVID-19 with hydroxychloroquine. Um, in general, we don't talk about cures. Whenever you hear the word cure, that should also, you know, raise some red flags. But this is some of the research that's been done with chloroquine and also uh, remdesivir antiviral. Remdesivir, the antiviral, was used a lot during MERS in 2012. Um, it showed that in uh, it, it, it stopped viral production in vitro, but in vivo it wasn't. It wasn't as promising. Chloroquine also used for a very long time when it comes to malaria. Um, however, again, the data for chloroquine also not, not the most promising. This is from The Lancet, looked at 600 plus hospitals from December to April, um, right around the peak, peak time of COVID-19, a retrospective review, looked at patients who were treated with chloroquine within 48 hours and usually with a combination of azithromycin and it showed that they, there was no benefit when it came to mortality and then there was increased negative outcomes, um, prolonged QT leading to ventricular arrhythmias. You know, azithromycin is also known to prolong QT, chloroquine also is known to prolong QT, but you know, hydroxychloroquine as far as we know now, it, it's not as promising as we once thought. Here's another trial with remdesivir. This is a very small. This is a very small trial. This was done in April, uh, and of only 237, and it showed that there was no significant decrease in mortality with remdesivir um, in the treatment and placebo group. This is a more promising. This is more recent. This is the ACT trial. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's just a prelim report but this is looking at the same endpoints as that last trial with remdesivir, but the N is much higher. It's 1,063 compared to only 237. And this trial actually shows some promise with remdesivir. It actually shows that uh, the trial had to be stopped early because of meeting one of its endpoints and mortality with the remdesivir group was about 8%, placebo was about 11.6%. And they said that was significant. So there's some promise when it comes to remdesivir. Then, you know, not to further complicate things, but then we have a lot of talk about antibodies. I know a lot of you guys working at your institutions might have gotten uh, asked by your hospital to get antibody testing. But this is a paper that was published in Nature back in June. It talks about disappearing antibodies. This showed that patients within eight weeks after recovery, patients with asymptomatic um, COVID-19, about 40% of them had undetectable uh, antibody levels just after eight weeks. And those that were very symptomatic, 13% uh, had, had lost their antibodies and, and, and they were undetectable within eight weeks of recovery. So this has major implications when it comes to herd immunity, when it comes to an actual vaccine, because if the antibodies don't last, which is different, which is you know different when compared to other viruses, this has major, major implications when it comes to things like vaccines and, and herd immunity. So this is another big topic of research. And uh, maybe we're looking at the wrong thing, maybe you know, it's more cell-mediated immunity. Maybe we're looking at the wrong side of it. Maybe we should be looking at T cells and not be looking at antibodies which are created from the B cells. You know, it just, it just leaves more questions.
And then we have some promising news with the role of steroids. We have decadron, dexamethasone, a glucocorticoid, a potent glucocorticoid. We also have cortisol, which is our body's natural glucocorticoid, which binds to the receptor involved with many homeostatic functions and also um, decreases our immune response. It's very controversial, the use of steroids. You know, there's some scenarios where it, it does get used. Meningitis, strep meningitis in particular, steroids actually decreases mortality when it comes to strep meningitis. But um, in very severe ARDS as well, steroids could potentially play a role, but the role of steroids in viral pneumonia is very controversial. The goal, of course, is to decrease the immune response, so kind of suppress the cytokine storm. But, you know, with some of the new trials that are coming out, like this recovery trial, it shows some promise. Um, it was basically compares patients who received dexamethasone to patients who were just being treated with standard symptomatic um, care alone. And it basically showed that mortality was highest as expected for those who required mechanical ventilation. And then it compared mortality from patients who received dexamethasone for 10 days. And what it showed is that dexamethasone reduced deaths by one third in ventilated patients and dexamethasone uh, reduced death by one fifth in patients receiving supplemental oxygen and dexamethasone really had no real uh, statistically significant difference in patients who did not require any respiratory support whatsoever. So there's some promise when it comes to dexamethasone. A lot of now physicians are trying to recommend to be on a short course of dexamethasone for patients with mild to moderate symptoms of, of COVID-19. And then briefly, I just had to throw in there, because of the fact that you see that most of the sequela and the morbidity, as well as the mortality from COVID-19 comes because of the immune response. No, no one is immune to this. Everybody has, has an immune system, adults and children. So this is like a very early paper from back in March during the peak time uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine just talked about the research from China showed that kids also had bilateral ground glass opacities about 32%. They had very mild symptoms. Then as you probably know about this MISC, which became pretty big in New York City, there was about 300 or so cases of a Kawasaki-like vasculitis that developed in children. So children sometimes have very mild symptoms and they can have something very severe, uh, vasculitity-like uh, syndrome here, MISC. So it just, the whole purpose of me putting it in there was just to reiterate the fact that you know, everybody has an immune system and that's why COVID-19 is dangerous for everybody, not just the elderly, not just those with pre-existing conditions. It, it, it's dangerous for just about everybody. So in the end, what does SARS-CoV-2 do to lead to multi-organ failure? It, number one, directly attacks our organs via the ACE2 receptor. We have indirect injury and collateral damage to our neighboring organs due to the cytokine storm. We have increased indirect damage, again, via clots. These are microthrombi as well as larger clots within our body leading to hypoxemia. And then we also have the result of this hypoxemia, which leads to you know, multi-organ failure, uh, shock, eventually cardiac arrest. And so SARS-CoV-2 is really a multitude of symptoms, all stemming from an overactive an overstimulated immune response, which ends up leading to the multitude of sequelae, which overall end up leading to multi-organ failure and unfortunately death. And that's basically SARS-CoV-2 in a very, very brief, simplified nutshell. And these are some of my references. I would like to thank everybody for listening um, to this talk. And if there's any questions, you can put them into the question box or on the chat. I'll be happy to answer them.
So if there's no particular questions, then um, I want to thank you guys again for joining me. I know it's a Friday evening. I know this talk was a little bit longer than what I thought it was going to be, but uh, the more you go into it, um, and again, this is only the tip of the iceberg, but I tried to just give a general overview of mortality when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, again, thank you so much.